Zechariah chapter number 7. Let me bring you up to speed what is going on in Israel. Israel had been in captivity for 70 years. They went into captivity because they ignored the preaching of the prophets, men like Jeremiah, who warned them if they didn't repent and turn back to God and turn from idol worship, Baal worship, false worship, and put the Lord, the Lord of their lives and the Lord of their nation, that God was going to bring judgment and God did. And Israel got destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And they were carried off into captivity for 70 years. Uh, and then we find, by the time we get to Zechariah and Haggai and some of these minor prophets, now they're coming out of captivity and they're uh, uh, starting to restore their lives and restore their heritage. Uh, but it's amazing that of all the restoring they do, they really don't restore worship the way it should be. Well, in Zechariah's day, by the time we get to chapter 7, they are asking the high priest if they should continue uh, uh, the fast that was part of the ceremony that uh, uh, they actually did while they were in captivity and in accordance to the law and should they do their fast in the fifth and seventh month like uh, uh, the fast feast like they were supposed to uh, or should they not do it? They're asking for direction from the high priest. And the answer comes in chapter number seven. We'll pick up our re reading in verse number eight. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. The Lord said, uh, here you're asking for fasting, you kept fasting. Uh, and the Lord said, uh, when I cried, you, didn't hear what I, you wouldn't hear what I had to say, so when you cried... I wouldn't hear what you had to say. Now notice a few things as a way of inter introduction. Notice first of all the requirement. They're wanting to know if they should fast. Now listen, fasting is always a good thing if God's ordered the fast. Yeah, fasting is a good thing as in your own personal life if you want direction and you want to get closer to God. But the Lord says, I'm not requiring a fast right now. Look what he is requiring of them. In verse number 9, the Bible says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment. Boy, wouldn't it be good if our Congress did that right now? Hmm? And that's all I'm going to say about that. And show mercy. Hmm? Wouldn't it be good if God's people truly ex executed true judgment? Not selfish judgment, not tainted judgment, not judgment where I'm judging somebody else, but I judge myself according to the scripture and I try the spirits whether they be of God. And uh, if I would show mercy, mm, if I would show compassions, every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. That was the requirement. Boy, can you imagine a world, if we lived in a world, where if that was the standard of people's conduct? Can you imagine a society if the religious world would live like that? If you could imagine, what kind of world would we live in if the saved community would live like that? But yet that is the requirement of God. 
That's what he wants out of us. Hmm? The New Testament says this, summarizing what we just read. Living soberly, godly, justly in this present day and age. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Hmm? That is the requirement. Now notice, if you will, the rejection. Look in verse 11. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. I mean, it's bad enough that they just didn't do it. But they refused to do it. They pulled away from it. Then they stopped up their ears so they wouldn't have to listen to it. Notice their remorselessness. Look at verse 12. Yea, they made their hearts as adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Notice they not only didn't listen, they not only didn't do it, they hardened their hearts against it so that the Spirit of God wouldn't even convict them to do it. They had no remorse in their sin. Can I say it is a dangerous thing to know the requirements of God and then reject it, but then sit there and thumb up your nose at God not even feeling bad that you rejected it. Can I say, week in and week out, people come to churches like ours, they hear preaching, they never let it impact them, and they never feel bad about it. Can I say it's dangerous? Can I say Paul said, for this reason there are some sickly among you. And then he goes on to say, and some sleep, or in other words, some are in the grave. Can I say, you only reject God so much, and God, when he is tired of you shaming him, he'll put you in the ground. Because he bought your life. And he wants your whole heart. We see God put up with them for a while and then great wrath came upon them. Look at the results. Uh, look at verse 13. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. You know what is wrong with America? People quit listening to what God required. Amen. People rejected what God required. Then people didn't feel bad about what God required, and God made our land desolate. There is an absolute shame and sham of lifestyle in our country, and nobody seems to care. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? Amen. It is a true day, or, or it is a true statement of the day that this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of men, uh, uh, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. We just had an, a, a fundamental Christian as a governor who straightened out a lot of wrongs in our state and we couldn't even re-elect him. Yeah. You know why? Because people don't want fundamentalism. Hmm? Uh, there were more people crying for abortion and a woman's right to choose than people crying for righteousness. Hmm? More people crying for liberalism than people crying for conservatism. Amen. It's an absolute shame, but it's a sign of the times. People don't care what God said. And it's even filtered into our churches. Hmm. Now, there's a whole lot of preaching to be done out of them verses. But I'm not going to preach along those lines. This is Wednesday night. These are folks that generally love church, love coming to church. And you've worked hard and you've labored and you've put up with a lot yet you're here tonight and you've come for some some help I hope but I'm interested in, in a phrase in verse 11 it says but they refused to hearken 
Now look here. And pulled away the shoulder. I'm interested in that. Because I try to make sense of things. Now don't get me wrong. It's dangerous when you try to use logic to figure out the things of God. Because you can't. The just are not to walk by logic. Or to walk by faith. But being an individual, there are some things I just don't understand. I don't understand how people can sit under preaching and it not impact them and cause them to want more of Jesus. I can't understand how people can hear, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful and not want more of it? I mean, listen. Miss Annette brought me an ice cream to come up to the bedroom last night because I can't watch TV in my great room anymore because Miss Annette's getting a new great room and Brother Ray's got it all tore up. Thank God for Brother Ray. So I was watching TV in my room last night and Miss Annette brought me an ice cream cone. It wasn't butter pecan, it was chocolate chip, wasn't it? Chocolate chip on a cone. Service with a smile. I love it. Yeah, but I'm out. I don't have no more ice cream. That's it. So you think I'm going to do without ice cream the rest of my life? No, ice cream's something wonderful too. <laughs> so we're going to Kroger's and I'm loading up on ice cream. Huh? When something is wonderful and you enjoy it, don't you want more of it? Yeah. Is there anything more wonderful than Jesus? No. Well, why would we want more of him? Huh? And I've tried in my mind, Brother Brian, I've tried to the best of my ability to remember, but I'm getting old. But I don't think I've been preaching mean lately. Now, I have preached mean. But I don't think I've been lately. I've tried to be kind of positive and try to help people and try to encourage people and try to make sense of some things. But sometimes, even that doesn't make people want more of the wonderful Jesus we have. Huh? I can understand it for about six weeks in a row. All I did was blister, folks. You know, I don't like to get blistered. Let me let you in on a little clue. I don't like preaching blistering messages. I'd much rather preach on heaven. But see, that's not up to me. That's up to the Lord. But those that just don't want enough of Jesus, I guess, they think that's me. And they think, Brother Doug's going to blister us again today. And I hope that's not the case. But listen, I can find nothing but wonderful things about Jesus. And so I try to try to wonder, but Phil, why don't folks want more of him? I, I, I just can't figure it out. I'm talking about saved people. Why don't saved people want more of Jesus? Uh, bingo. Hey, you want to finish it? I'll sit there and finish the message, huh? I mean, she just sang that song about with all her heart. And it, it amazes me. People give all their heart to a lot of things. They'll give all their heart to their job. No, you need a job. It's good to have a job. Thank God for a good job. But you give all your heart to your job. But you won't give all your heart to the Lord. Listen, when you're on your job, you ought to give everything you got to your boss. You ought to work hard for your money. Because there's somebody waiting to take your job if you don't. But when it comes to Jesus, you ought to give him your best. I don't understand that. There be people give all their heart to riding roller coasters. You know, there are people that travel the country to ride every roller coaster. Have at it. I used to like them. Then I turned 40. And gravity in 40 doesn't do well. 50 riding in the car isn't good. Are you listening? Getting close to 60, walking on a sidewalk will make you dizzy. Are you listening? But there are folks that'll ride roller coasters. Have at it. But well, why would you give all your heart to roller coaster riding and not to Jesus? Amen. There are folks that give all their heart to football, all their heart to basketball, all their heart. But why won't you give all your heart to Jesus? Sure. I just don't understand it. I'm talking about folks that claim to be saved. I just don't. I, it, if I had a lot of hair, I'd pull it out. I just, I try to wonder and I try to think and I try to uh, say, you know, I, I'm always questioning, is there something I could say to be more encouraging? Is there something I could do to help? For, why don't people 
Want more, Jesus. That phrase there, I, I couldn't get off my mind. They were pulling their shoulders away. And see, when you don't give all your heart, you don't go all in. It's like you're pulling away your shoulder, you're being hesitant. Can I say, you can come to church every time the doors are open, but you can still be hesitant instead of going all in. And so I want to preach for just a few minutes to try, if nothing else, figure out what I can't figure out. As the Lord began speaking to my heart, while I'm watching Ray put stone on my fireplace. So I, I want to preach on this thought. I want to preach on why are some hesitant. I mean, they're not hesitant about everything in their life, so why would they be hesitant about the things of God? Amen. I mean, some of them do crossword puzzles like crazy, but they won't read the Bible. And some will talk on the phone endlessly, but they won't ever talk to God. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Why are they hesitant? Why do folks, when they sit in church and they hear positive, I mean, the Lord isn't being real mean in this, in this message of requirement. I mean, look at it. He's not being mean at all. He said, execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion, so oppress not the widow, nor the followers, the stranger, the poor. I mean, let none uh, of you imagine evil against his brother's heart. That's all good positive stuff. I mean, help the poor, help the widows, help the fatherless, uh, uh, show compassion and mercy to folks, be good to people. I mean, that's all good stuff. Why would you be hesitant about all that? Now, I can imagine if God said, you got to part the Red Sea with your own faith. Now, that you could be hesitant about. I mean, it took a special man, Moses, who had been through a whole lot, and been in, on the backside of the desert for 40 years till he's ready to hear from God. And uh, it took him, uh, God doing a great work in his life, being 80 years old before he was ready to part the Red Sea. Are you listening? He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord because God had done a great work in his life. But he doesn't ask us to part the Red Sea. He doesn't ask us to do it. He tells us, show mercy. Be good. Amen. Uh, help those that need help. I mean, what's not why are folks hesitant? That boggles me. Well, let me give you a few things. This is what the Lord gave me. Can I say some are hesitant because of a lack of faith? They got enough faith to get saved, but they don't have enough faith that God can handle the rest of it. Now we know, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you only eat one meal a week, you're not going to be very healthy. Amen. And if you only eat one meal a week from the word of God, you're not going to have much faith. Right. Mm. If you come every time the doors are open and that's all you ever get, you're not going to have a lot of faith. Because then you're putting your faith in what the preacher has studied. You know when you get real faith is when you put uh, your faith and you, you grow your faith in what you've studied yeah. Amen. and what God has showed you. Sure. When the devil's telling you you're sorry and no good and God gives you that golden nugget, what do you think that did for you? That did more for you for your faith than me telling you something because right. God showed you that. Good. Well, those that are hesitant, they're lacking faith. It's not because they don't believe in God. It's not because they don't think Jesus is wonderful. It, it's not because they don't think God's able to do all things. It's just they don't have faith God can do all things for them. Amen. And they're hesitant. Hmm? It's just like me getting on a roller coaster. I know the thing's going to finish where it started. And I know everybody that got on is getting off. And I know nobody's going to die. But I still don't want to get on the thing. Especially that, what is it, the diamond back when you go down the hill and you leave the seat and there's nothing but this little thing holding you in. No thank you. Did it once, that's enough. Okay? Huh? There are just certain things I'm hesitant in. Huh? How many of you ever remember the beast? The reason I've had 
two back surgeries is because I used to ride that thing a lot. <laughs> uh, I love the sound of them old wooden roller coasters, but they'll kill you. And every time I rode the beast, I'd get bruised. Usually because of my long legs and, and hit that thing in front of me, that seat in front of me. I mean, you, you get off the thing, you're bruised. You say, oh gosh, let's ride it again. Huh? But if you rode the beast, coming down the hill, you went immediately into a tunnel. And when you're at the top of that hill, you look down, that tunnel looks like it's about this big. And when you're at the top of the hill climbing, you're brave. You've got your hands up. Man, hey, yeah, let's ride this thing. You go over, you start looking at that tunnel, and the closer you get, the shorter your arms get. <laughs> no one ever lost fingers on that tunnel. But you still get hesitant, don't you? Well, the same thing happens when it comes to, to God. You know that you, you're going to get through this thing. But when you have a lack of faith, you're pulling your arms down. You're not worshiping. You come to the house of God, uh, uh, you're not going to shout amen. You're not going to uh, uh, be rejoicing. You're not going to enjoy everything the way you could enjoy it because you're being hesitant because you're lacking faith. And some are hesitant because of a lack of faith. It's not because they've lived in sin. It's not because they're morally bankrupt. It's not because uh, 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 of anything else. It's just they haven't given God enough time throughout the week and their faith hasn't increased. And when they come to the house of God, they don't know how to act. They're hesitant. Hmm? Can I say this? Why are some people hesitant? Not only because of a lack of faith, because some just have fearfulness. Their lack of faith has led them to a miserable life of not, you know, just living in fear. You ought to stand up here when we sing victory in Jesus and look out there. You'll see the ones that have victory in Jesus. It's very evident. Boy, their face is lighting up like a Christmas tree. But you can look around and you can see some that are singing the words, but you can see fear stricken on their face. Because they don't have victory in Jesus. You say, you talking about, no, I'm talking about saved people that don't have victory. You say, well, how can that happen? You just read throughout the prophets and the minor prophets, you'll see a whole nation that didn't have victory. And there's a lot of folks that are going to heaven. There's names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They do not have victory because they live in fear. Hmm? Now, we talked about the wonderful love of Jesus. You know why it's wonderful? Because he said, perfect love casteth out all fear. And when your love is right, and your love can't be right unless your faith's right, but when your love is right, guess what? You're not afraid. And yes, Miss Crystal, I wasn't afraid to go to the doctor today, even though I knew he was going to send a scope down my nose. And that is the weirdest thing because that stuff they put on there to numb your nose, one nostril was numb for about four hours. That is a weird thing. But it is a great thing not having cancer. And I told Miss Annette, what I go through is a piece of cake compared to what a lot of people have to go. I, I was at that cancer center looking at people that have no hope and that were miserable, and I didn't have that. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. I, was, I was not afraid at all, nor am I afraid about the future, because I know in whom I believed him and persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Why? Because I have faith. And thanks be unto God, I have love in my heart towards him. But there are a lot of people who are fearful because their love's not right. Their love's not right because their faith's not right and they're hesitant. That fear keeps them in bondage. Yeah. There is no place for bondage in the, in the life of a Christian. You have been set free by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to camp in Ephesians. Ephesians is a book of victory. Thank God for victory. Amen. And it is available to every believer. Amen. But when you live in fear, you're in bondage. I got to thinking about what some people are afraid of. Some people are afraid and they're hesitant and they're fearful 
because they're fearful of not knowing. You know, those that have learned the secret to the economy of God realize I don't have to know or you don't have to know. He already knows. All I got to do is follow. But them not knowing whatever it is that God is trying to pull them towards scares them to death. I've used the analogy I don't know how many times about stepping out when you don't see anything to step on. Just like those priests when they had the ark and they stepped in Jordan and the water swayed one step at a time. Why did they step in the first place? They believed God. And friends, when your faith's in Him and He's told you to do it, He'll catch your foot when you take the step. But folks live in fear, don't they can't do that. They can't get in the deep because they can't get to the edge because they're afraid to look in the deep because they don't know what's there. And they stay on the sincere milk of the word. They never grow and they're baby Christians and they're hesitant and afraid of everything. Great day in your life when you realize you don't need to know. Just trust him. Hmm? There are a lot of things that it's better for you not to know. Because if you knew what you may have to go through, you'd never get off the porch. But if you just follow him, you'll find all the way, wherever he takes you, he's growing you and preparing you and strengthening you that when you do have to go through it, you can go through it. I'm glad he doesn't tell us everything. But I'm glad we can trust him. Because he'll not put more on us than we're able to bear. There's some they're fearful and not knowing. There's some who are fearful because of what may be required of them. There are some people that are afraid to submit their life for whatever God wants for them. Even though Hebrews chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us to, that we're to submit ourselves and become a living sacrifice you know, because uh, wholly acceptable unto God because that's our reasonable service and there are some folks that will never surrender and never tell God whatever you want in my life I'm willing to do it because they're scared to death they're going to end up in Africa. Hmm? Now did I not just say that he'll not put more on you than you're able to bear? You know why I didn't? I knew I wouldn't go to Africa. Snakes and no chocolate. Two good reasons. Huh? Could you live without chocolate? Yep. Could you live with snakes? Only if God was there with me. But He didn't tell me to handle snakes, and I ain't going that way. Hmm. I'm just trying to tell you there are so many things we worry about, and worry is a sin. And it creates fear. If we would just learn to trust Him. Hmm? Listen. Did not Jesus tell us we're to have a childlike faith? Yes, sir. Hmm? Except, except you become like one of these little ones. It's a childlike faith. Children will trust their parents with everything. Parents will... will get in a pool and tell the children just come in I'll catch you and yeah we'll catch them take them all the way to the bottom bring them back up put them on the co- uh, up on the pool again and say come on back up and they'll do it again because they trust and yet all God says is trust me and we won't trust him because we're afraid of what he may require of us hmm? listen whatever it is Listen, it'll be worth it. And it's wonderful. Because isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Hmm? And a lot of times, Brother Clint, it's not what he may ask of them, it's what he may ask them to give up. And I have learned that anything that he asks you to forsake, he always replaces it with something much greater. He said uh, uh, a hundredfold, which is a hundred times better than what you're giving up. 
But see, you got to get over the fear. And you got to walk by faith. If you're ever going to see a hundredfold. Hmm? I always am remiss talking about things that we left behind when we went into the ministry full time or went into the pastorate. But it is fair to say we gave up a big paying job for next to nothing. But can I say I live in a much nicer house. I drive nicer vehicles. I have more children. I mean, God blessed me more than a hundredfold. I am living far better than we ever lived back then. You know why? Because God's word's true. God knows how to take care of his children. But those that are hesitant may even know that because they've heard it, but they've never experienced it because they're fearful. They're fearful of not knowing. They're fearful of what may be required. Or they're just fearful of people. Some people will never serve God because they're afraid of what other people may think or say. Isn't it better to be more afraid of what God thinks or says than what people think or say? Really, what's the big deal about being afraid of people? Huh? Some people won't pray over their food in a restaurant. Well, what will these people think? You're never going to see these people again. Who cares? But I sure don't want to choke on my food and die and not have not thanked God for it. Why are we so afraid of people? Hmm? If you haven't seen the picture, you need to see the picture. I told the story, but it's still funny. I'm going to tell it again. Marcy wasn't here. She might not have heard the story. Huh? But, you know, we went and saw Sid play in South Carolina. And, you know, I told you, we ended up eating at a mall because the food court got a lot of stuff normally. And, you know, this food court didn't have anything. This food court had seven Chinese or Japanese restaurants. <laughs> Thank God for Sbarro. I had a pizza. Huh? But I look up, and here comes Sydney and her team, and, and she ate with us. It was good. It was unexpected, you know, and then she had a few minutes before they had to get on their bus to go to the game, and we were just going to hang out at the mall until it was game time anyway. And so we're walking through the mall, and Christian says, Santa, let's get our picture with Santa. And so Sydney says, yeah, so we did. Okay, we got our picture with Santa. It was stupid. But we did. And it's a great picture. It really is for something so silly and so stupid. But do you think I gave a rip over what anybody in the mall in Columbia, South Carolina thought about me standing there next to Santa? I didn't care. I got a picture of my office. I don't care. People come in and say, well, well you got a picture with Santa Claus. Don't you know that's wicked? I wasn't worshiping him. I just get a picture with him. He was a nice old guy. Huh? The truth of the matter is, he asked Sydney what she wanted. She said, a win. He said, a win. She said, yeah, I'm here to play basketball. And then she said, and 30 points wouldn't be, wouldn't be bad either. She got a win and scored 30. I mean, Santa's good, man. Huh? <laughs> I wish I'd asked for a vet. Huh? You get so caught up in what people think. Who cares? That is a terrible life to live, being afraid of what everybody else thinks. And especially in a great church like ours. So what if God breaks your heart and you've got to come in the altar and cry? We've got tissues. Yeah. Amen. So what if uh, 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 God asks you to testify? Yeah. So what if God asks you to sing a song and get up on the stage and sing it? Who cares what people think? And guess what? It was a blessing. Yeah. 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 It sure been worse than you sitting there all night thinking, boy, I should have got up there and sang. Mm. Right. Amen. we got the rule mind the Lord how come so many people are hesitant yeah. and if they've been coming here in length of time they've never seen us all up here laughing at somebody praying in the altar so what are they afraid of sure. it's all because they haven't met with Jesus before they get here That's true. I thought about this some people are hesitant because they're frozen and I'm not talking about Anna and Elsa. Mm, that's for all the kiddies. And a few of you adults. The Disney nerds right up front here. Uh, 
Some are just cold and indifferent on God. When you're cold and indifferent on God, guess what? You're not on fire for God. And guess what? You're going to, you're going to be hesitant. There's some people, they'll never move because they're cold. You would think it is a natural, again, we're talking logic here, but isn't it natural when you're cold to want to move toward the fire? Get warmed up? But in the ways of faith, when people are cold, they want to get away from the fire. Don't you realize that's, that you're going to get worse shape? And I'm saying some are not only cold and indifferent, some they're frozen because they've gotten comfortable. They've just got into a routine and a rut. Now we can throw off on the Catholics all day long about their rituals. About the, for them praying there are fathers and Hail Marys and about their kneeling and getting up, kneeling and getting up, kneeling and getting up, kneeling and getting up. Huh? We can talk about their weddings lasting four hours and all that stuff. But we got some very good Catholic Baptists. They've, they've come to where church is a religion. It's a ritual. They just go through the same motions week in and week out. That's why they're hesitant. Hmm? Because it would cause them to get out of their ritual. Hmm? Here's a newsflash. People are creatures of habit. By nature, we are creatures of habit. That's why Jesus gave us a new nature when we got saved. But if we don't feed that inner man, we're going to revert to the old man. And the old man says, I like doing the same routine. Because I don't like change. Hmm? That's why you get ready the same way every day. That's why you drive to work the same way every day. That's why you do everything exactly the same. When you go to the restaurant, you always order the same thing at the same restaurant because you've ate it a million times and you're comfortable with it. Sure. Hmm? I tried a few times ordering other stuff. I didn't like it, so I'll go back to the comfortable stuff. We were somewhere and I ordered something and said, I can't believe you didn't order something and I ate. I said, I wish I'd ordered that other thing because this stinks. Because huh? we're creatures of habit. Happens in church. Folks are hesitant because they're comfortable. That's why I told you before, confuse the devil and switch pews and you all did that and I couldn't find you in the service. And I got uncomfortable. That's not a bad thing. Get frozen in complacency. Hmm? Listen, you love your whole church family, but truth be told, you only socialize with a few because you've gotten comfortable with them. I got news for you. You got other friends on the other side of the building. You ought to go get familiar with them. Hmm? And they're all Baptists, so they all like to eat. Well, I wouldn't know what to talk about. Talk about the preachers. They'll talk, talk about how crazy and weird he is. You know, you'll have a lot in common then. You'll have a lot to talk about. But we just get comfortable. Hmm? It makes us hesitant. Not only being frozen makes you cold and indifferent and comfortable, but some people are frozen because they get contrary. You cannot have the fire of God in your soul when you're contrary to the things of God. There are some folks that come to church, but they're contrary. They're anti-anything. They're contrary. Hmm? They get in the car with whoever they came with, and you know, their husband, wife, children, or something. They say, Boy, wasn't that a good service? Well, I didn't think it was that good. Boy, wasn't Brother James and Mr. Renee's song that good today? Well, I like the other one better. You know, we can just go on and on and on. They're just contrary. Do you ever know folks that way? Yep. Yes, sir. We have a relative. We tried a test one time. No matter what, they've done it bigger and better. So we start inventing stuff just to see how far they take it. Oh, they never did catch on. You know? There's contrary. You know, there's some people that way. You just get contrary. When you're contrary, you're hesitant. Because you're contrary. It'd be positive to get right with God, but you're contrary. 
well if I get right with God then I can't be this and there are some folks who are just frozen they're frozen in gear they can't get where they need to be can I say this some people are hesitant because they're constantly fighting with God just like this crowd here God spoke to them they rejected it and then they made their heart even harder and they weren't even remorseful for it they just kept going farther and farther and farther away they would not submit to God Jeremiah told them hey walk in this way this is the good way the old paths uh, you'll find rest for your souls they said we will not walk that way there's some people they just fight with God God speaks to their heart and they tell them no God speaks to their heart again they tell them no he speaks to their heart again and tell them no now I don't mean speak to God mean you got to repent and you know do all this penance and all sometimes he just says you know what you ought to go talk to somebody no I'm not going to go do that today Oh, you ought to send a card to somebody. Oh, I'll get to it. You don't get to it. And some, it, it usually starts off real small. And then God keeps just speaking and keeps speaking and speaking. Then they get to church. And God's saying, you, you need to go up to somebody and tell them, you know what? I, I haven't prayed for somebody when I told you what. No, I ain't doing that. And, you know, and, and they just get telling God no and telling God no. And, telling, and then they're constantly just arguing with God. And finally they think, oh, well, if I just quit going to church, I, I won't have to fight with God anymore. And now they're out, out of church and they're still fighting with God. Because they still drive by churches. They still hear people say something about the Lord. And in their heart they're fighting against God. Amen. You're always going to be hesitant when you're fighting against God. Because friend, he don't fight fair. He'll take your sleep away. Yep. Take your joy away. Take your health away. You know. You always lose when you fight against him. But they just constantly are fighting against God. You know, I mentioned something about comfort zone a minute ago. And I thought of something when I was on the platform. I'm just going to say, you know, some people are fighting against that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, you know, somebody said give the devil their due. Well, I'm going to do that right now. Miss Lisa's got out of her comfort zone. She just went back and sat in with Miss Kathy, maybe to be a substitute teacher sometime. That's out of your comfort zone, isn't it? Because you're not real smart, are you? You've got to teach these kids. No. No. That's a blessing. That blessed my heart. Here she is at something out of her comfort zone, something that she wouldn't have signed it, but you know, evidently the Lord's been speaking her heart. And she said, you know what? I'm going to give this a try. Maybe if uh, God ever wants to use me in that capacity. What a blessing. Sure. You know what? It's, and the, the kids are great to work with because they don't know if you're smart or not. They're great. You just tell them a few things and throw some chocolate at them. They'll love you. But see, there are some people that are constantly fighting against God. Amen. Well, guess what? God hits you up a he upside the head a few times. You're going to get hesitant too. Yeah. It'd be best if you just submit. And I thought about this lastly. Why are some people so hesitant? Some are hesitant, Brother Phil, because they're false. Amen. Yeah. A non Christian cannot live a Christian life. They can dress like a Christian. They can act like a Christian for a little while. But a non-Christian cannot live a Christian life. If he does not live in you, then you won't be able to live for him. Amen. Can I say this? Life is hard enough. But if you try to live life as a Christian and you're not a Christian, you can't do it. And that's why some are so hesitant. Because deep down inside, they've tried to make it look like they're saved. But deep down inside, they know they're empty and they're not saved. But they're afraid to crumb, confront it. And so they're hesitant. And God just speaks to them. And God woos them. And God tells them, you're not saved. You're not saved. You're not saved. And they keep trying to talk themselves into being saved and being saved. And they're not saved. And that's why they're so hesitant. Listen. If Jesus is something wonderful to you, even when you're cold, you know he's wonderful. Even when you're contrary, you know he's wonderful. Even when you're stuck in a rut, you know he's wonderful. And see, my dear friends, if you don't know that he's wonderful, 
you don't know that he knows what's best. And even those fighting against God, they know God knows what's best. And they know what they need to do. They're just embarrassed. But those that are false, they don't know. Because they don't know him. Amen. So I said all of that to say this. Help your preacher to live longer. Don't be hesitant. Don't pull your shoulder away. When God speaks, say, yes, Lord. And if you're in a position where your faith is when you say, Lord, help mine unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help mine unbelief. Help me to be what you want me to be. Because your love is something wonderful. And I do want to give you my whole heart. So why don't you give him your whole heart, not just when you're in church, but every day of your life. And friend, you won't be hesitant. When he speaks, you'll say, yes, Lord. I find you'll say, yes, Lord, before you even really realize he's speaking. Because it's so natural. You just want to please him. And that's a much better life than a life that's hesitant. Don't be hesitant. I'm glad Jesus wasn't hesitant when he went to Calvary. So why should we be hesitant when he asks us to do anything minis you know, minimal? Usually he doesn't ask very much of us. Amen. Just do what he says to do. He gets glory and you get blessed. So don't be hesitant. So there's too many that are. And maybe if we quit being hesitant, they'll learn not to be hesitant. And who knows what God will do then. All right, I'm done. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, thank you for the scriptures. They not only convicted us so we could get saved, they feed us and grow our faith. Lord, I'm thankful that we can find instruction on every page in the Word of God. Now, Lord, forgive me when I'm hesitant. Help me, Lord, to truly walk by faith. And God, I pray for any of these dear folks that may be hesitant. God, help them. Lord, I pray something tonight you said I trust will help them to realize why they've been hesitant. And then, God, I pray for those that aren't here. And it's not because they're providentially hindered. They're just not here. I pray, Lord, they'd learn not to be hesitant. And, God, I pray you truly send revival. And we'd see great things done because you are wonderful and in every sense of the word. I'm blessing this invitation. Help folks. Increase our faith and get glory from our lives. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.